Uh, good evening, everyone. Joe uh, Quilly uh, here, one of the um, orthopedic consultants at the Sports Surgery Clinic. Uh, I'm also an associate professor at Trinity College Dublin. And uh, my talk this evening is uh, five common questions that patients ask me about uh, hip replacements. Uh, and the idea is that I, I will uh, uh, try and give you uh, answers based on the most recent uh, evidence and scientific uh, literature that's that's uh, 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 that's available. So, asking questions about hip replacements uh, in general, it's it's important to ask uh, your surgeon, whoever uh, he or she may be, uh, uh, as to how successful it is. And these are questions uh, would, that would include how long would it last. Uh, what type of hip replacement is being used? Uh, uh, questions that are particularly rele relevant to your personal situation. Uh, uh, what do you want to be able to do after the hip replacement? And also uh, to take into account what medical problems you might have, such as having diabetes uh, or being overweight, uh, how this might affect your hip replacement, and what you can do uh, to, uh, to help optimize and make sure that you have the best uh, outcome uh, possible. And it's, it's good to have uh, answers that are based on the most uh, up-to-date available evidence uh, uh, as possible. Because in medicine, uh, 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 facts and evidence change uh, change all the time. And, and, and it's important to have the most accurate and up-to-date uh, information when you're, you know, when you're making a decision about going ahead with, with the total uh, hip replacement uh, so before we get into these questions, I'm just going to, in a very simple way, discuss how do we measure success after a total hip replacement. So there's two basic ways that we measure success. The first that we look at is implant survivorship. And by that, I mean, is how long does uh, the joint replacement last? And that's really important because you want your hip replacement to, long, to last for as long as, uh, as, long as possible. The, section, the, the second uh, 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 question uh, that we look at is how well does your hip replacement work? Uh, so we want it to last really long and we want it to work uh, really well. And in terms of how well it works, we're interested in particularly uh, how quickly uh, patients can get back to, <coughs> to function, so to walking and to doing things that they, that they would like to do. And we're also in, interested in seeing uh, 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 how long this good function uh, lasts so we would hope that your hip would, along with lasting a long time, that it would also work very well for a, uh, for a long time. And this, when we're looking at, you know, deciding what type of hip replacement to use or, and how to put it in, these are the two basic questions that we, uh, that we, uh, that we look at. And how do we uh, gather evidence on, uh, on hip replacements? There's a, there's a few basic ways that we can gather evidence. The first is that uh, 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 surgeons record how well their patients did. And they published their work in a, uh, in an academic paper, and a, a simple example of this is uh, a surgeon might say, "I did fifty hip replacements. Uh, I asked them questions about uh, how well they recovered, and I found that they could all walk without crutches uh, by eight weeks after their surgery." This this limits the amount. This generally uh, uh, limits the amount of uh, patients to relatively smaller numbers. The second way that we can uh, uh, try and, and figure out which is the best type of hip replacement or the best type of technique is we can compare two different treatments. So uh, a surgeon can set up a study where he does or she does 25 hip replacement re replacements using uh, one technique and then does 25 hip replacements uh, compared to a different technique. And they can say that, well, you know, the X technique resulted in a better hip replacement because it lasted for, you know, for 10 years longer than, than the Y hip replacement. And the third uh, way we have of, uh, of looking at how well joint replacements do in general is that, uh, in, uh, and this is now becoming more common, is that in, uh, in, in, uh, in most countries, all surgeons have to report on how well their patients did to a national body. So you have to submit data saying what type of hip replacement that you have done and, and, uh, and then data is, consequent, is subsequently uh, gathered on how well, how long your hip replacements last and how well they, uh, and how well they work. And this, is a re this is a really powerful uh, tool because it, it gathers information on hundreds of thousands of hip replacements over prolonged periods of time. And it gives, you know, gives really good evidence on uh, which replacements uh, work, work best 
and as you know, as as care and techniques evolve, which techniques are better than uh, are better than uh, than others. So that's just a backdrop to for us to uh, how we you know how we figure out how uh, joint replacements uh, uh, work well, and you know when I'm answering the five most common questions, this is uh, these these are the, the type of evidence and studies that I uh, that uh, that I will be uh, um, uh, discussing. So the first question, I, uh, 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 the most obvious question is, what is a hip replacement? Uh, so a, 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 hip, a hip replacement is where uh, somebody's hip joint, which is this circle here, is removed in its uh, entirety uh, due to a problem with it. Uh, and an implant, which we can see here on the right, is, uh, is put in uh, in its place. Uh, and the implant mimics uh, the um, your natural hip and that it's a ball and socket type uh, implant. So the socket part here goes into the pelvis uh, and into the thigh bone here, there is a uh, there is a stem with a ball part uh, attached. And the actual uh, joint then is this ball and socket uh, uh, bearing here, which the idea is that it mimics your, uh, you know, your own native uh, 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 hip joint. So when do we do it? So the most common reason for, for doing hip replacement is for uh, arthritis of the hip. Uh, what is arthritis? So a normal hip joint, as we can see here on the left, the ball and socket part of the joint is uh, is lined with cartilage, which, which is a very smooth uh, structure that allows your joint to move like a bearing and it, it allows it to move in a smooth and friction-free way. What happens with arthritis is that this uh, this cartilage lining gets worn out or gets destroyed for a variety of different reasons. And because of that, your hip joint uh, is no longer able to move in a smooth and uh, pain-free way. Uh, and what happens after a while is that bone starts to uh, uh, grind on bone. This causes uh, severe hip pain uh, and consequent uh, 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 reduced ability to walk and to, uh, you know, to, to do uh, uh, things like you know, play golf, or gardening uh, or, or, or hiking. So really osteoarthritis is, is damaged uh, cartilage around the, uh, uh, in the, uh, around the lining of the, the, both the ball and the soccer part of the, uh, of the hip joint. This is an example here on an x-ray of a normal hip uh, 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 over here uh, on the left side. And we can see space between the, the ball and soccer part of the hip joint. And this is where the car that cartilage sits that I've, uh, I've just mentioned earlier. When we look at the right here, there's no space between the uh, bones. This is because the cartilage has been uh, has been uh, has been damaged or, or, or uh, worn away. And what's happening here on the right side is that bone is is grinding on bone. And it's a bit like a rusty hinge. It doesn't move in a smooth uh, manner. It causes pain, and because of that, uh, you know. Uh, 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 patients uh, can't walk properly, uh, and they can't do activities uh, uh, such as, as I said, such as such as playing golf or even dressing themselves, or even uh, 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 getting in and out of a car can be uh, can be difficult. This is an example of a patient who has had uh, arthritis uh, in both uh, hips, uh, and he's had a, a both hip replacements uh, uh, replaced, uh, or both hips uh, replaced. Uh, uh, as we can see here. So the second question uh, then uh, that I get asked uh, um, uh, uh, quite commonly is how long will my hip replacement last? And again, this is a really important question uh, because we don't want, uh, we want the hip replacements to last for as long as possible because sometimes we need to do a hip replacement a second time around and that's called a revision hip replacement. And revision hip replacements are a uh, harder operation uh, both for patients to recover from and also for the surgeon to uh, for the surgeon to uh, to carry out uh, and they're best avoided uh, uh, for as long as possible and that's why we tend to avoid doing hip replacements in younger patients uh, because we want to avoid having to do a second hip replacement and some patients uh, they need three and four and in very rare cases even up to five hip replacements over a, uh, over a prolonged uh, uh, period. So how long can we say that hip replacements uh, last uh, in general? Well, this is, is a, a, a paper published uh, in 2019 in The Lancet, which is one of the leading medical journals. And the, uh, the uh, authors looked at 
uh, at, uh, at a huge number of uh, hip replacements that were reported in the uh, in the uh, in the scientific literature. So they, they looked at all surgeons who had reported how well their hip replacements were doing, and they also looked at joint registries. So uh, in countries such as the UK, uh, uh, New Zealand, Australia, and the Scandinavian countries, who have been recording uh, 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 all hip replacements that are done in their countries and how long they last. And they added all the hips uh, together to try and come up with a, a figure, you know, uh, uh, how long does the average hip replacement uh, uh, last for? Uh, and they looked at the number, number of hips that they included in the study was, uh, was, two, uh, was uh, 228,888 hips, which is a huge number. And this is really good because the more numbers in a study, the more accurate and the more better the, uh, the data is. So what did they find? They found that um, for 85% uh, of patients they can expect their hip replacement to last 15 years. 75% of patients can expect their hip replacement to last 20 years. And 58% of patients can expect their uh, hip replacements to last uh, 25 years. So, so roughly over half of patients who have a hip replacement can expect it to last uh, uh, 25 years, which is, which is, which is, which is a good outcome. Uh, uh, and uh, and this has you know these figures have slowly improved over the past uh, uh, thirty to forty years. Obviously, the 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 other side of this is that you know forty percent of patients their hip replacement won't last twenty five years, and these patients uh, uh, often need a, a, a having uh, having to have their hip replacement done a, a second time, which is called a revision uh, hip replacement. Uh, the average age at which which uh, patients in the study, uh, the, the patients have hip replacements is 67. Uh, majority were uh, were uh, women at 55 percent, and the vast majority of hip replacements were carried out for uh, osteoarthritis. Uh, uh, and other causes for hip replacements, apart from arthritis, would be uh, for patients who have damaged their hip really badly after an accident, who have a really bad hip fracture. Uh, patients who have had um, infections in their hip, which is which is unusual, but sometimes uh, happens, or patients who have had childhood hip disease, so who've had an issue with uh, with their hips uh, uh, since birth, where their hips haven't quite uh, formed uh, uh, properly. The uh, another question I get asked uh, all the time in my clinic is which surgical approach uh, is best. And by which surgical approach I mean is what's the best way uh, uh, to, put, to put in a hip replacement and uh, the best way to get in around the muscles uh, to put the hip replacement uh, in. So this is uh, there's three basic ways uh, to do this. Uh, uh, one is the anterior approach, and this is, this is where the hip replacement is put in from the front of your hip. Uh, uh, there is what's called the anterolateral approach, where the hip replacement is put in from the side. And then there is the posterior approach, where the hip replacement is put in from the uh, is put in from the back of your hip. And there are the three main way, ways that we uh, that we put hip replacements in at the uh, at the minute. And patients uh, often uh, often ask, well, which is which of these three is the best way? Uh, is the best way to uh, to do it? So the posterior approach, uh, which is the approach that I use, is the most common, most commonly used. And this is where the hip replacement is put in via dissection through the muscles at the back of the hip. This is a good approach because it gives a very good view of the hip joint itself and it allows uh, uh, the hip replacement to be uh, put in in a really good uh, position. The, there's a theoretical disadvantage that there might be a higher risk of uh, dislocation. The second uh, approach is the, uh, is the anterolateral. This is where the hip is put in from the side and this uh, involves going through muscles at the side of the hip. And uh, uh, the potential disadvantage of this is that there may be a slight uh, uh, risk of limp after this uh, approach due to, due to disrupting the muscles at the side of your uh, hip. Uh, and the third approach is the anterior approach, which is a newer approach where the hip is hip replacement is put in from the front of the hip. Uh, and muscle sparing uh, means that it, instead of cutting through muscles, the hip replacement is put in uh, in between uh, uh, muscles. And uh, the 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 uh, assumed advantage of this is that there may be you may get back yeah, quicker to doing activities such as uh, such as walking. The disadvantage of this is that there might be a slight increased risk of problems afterwards, such as uh, fracture 
when putting the hip replacement in or injuring nerves at the front of your uh, at the front of your hip. And you know, for obviously, you know, for for surgeons and for patients, you know, we all want to know well, which of these three approaches is the best, and which one should I have for my particular uh, um, uh, uh, for my particular situation. Uh, and you know, the, the the answer needs to be found in in the evidence, and what uh, and what uh, um, and what uh, you know studies show to be the difference between the three approaches. I just picked a one a one very recent paper which was published in June last year, uh, which was uh, comes from Boston and Copenhagen, and uh, these uh, surgeons they looked they they took uh, ninety three patients uh, in two different groups, and in one uh, uh, patient they used the anterior approach, and in the, in the second ninety three patients they used the uh, posterior approach. And what they looked at were how how well do the hip replacements function at uh, from six weeks up to uh, to five years? So they're they're wondering which approach, the anterior approach from the front or the posterior approach from the back, results in the best uh, 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 hip function at uh, you know from very early on to to the five year uh, mark. Uh, they found that both approaches resulted uh, in a significant improvement in function. By asking patients questions such as you know how far can you walk, what activities of daily living uh, can you do, and they found that there was no difference between the two approaches uh, in scores uh, at six weeks, one year, or five year. So they found for hip function, it doesn't really matter which approach uh, uh, is used. There's no uh, there's no difference. Uh, the next uh, uh, paper I'm going to look at is again, as I mentioned at the beginning, is how uh, is how long does a hip replacement last uh, when it's done via the uh, uh, anterior, the from the front, uh, from the side, or from the back? This is a study uh, from the one of the Scandinavian uh, registries, and they looked at, at over twenty thousand patients uh, that had each of these uh, three approaches, either again from the front, from the side, or from the back. And they looked at implant survival at two and uh, and five years, and they found no difference between the approaches in terms of survivorship. Uh, they're uh, ninety eight percent uh, at five years, so they, it, 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 and they concluded that how long a hip replacement lasts is not linked to which uh, approach is used. So, in terms of which approach to recommend to patients, uh, the scientific evidence does not show benefit of one approach uh, uh, over over another. In terms of how long the implant lasts, uh, uh, how well it works, or how quickly patients uh, return to uh, to walking. So I, I, even though I do one approach, the posterior approach, because it, it, it's the approach that I have uh, been trained in, but I, I, I can't say that that's any better than the other two uh, approaches, and and uh, and uh, and vice versa. So uh, moving on to question number four, uh, it's this is about. Uh, uh, what about hip resurfacing, resurfacing instead of hip replacement, which I get uh, occasionally uh, asked. So what is hip resurfacing? Well, hip resurfacing is a form of hip replacement where uh, instead of taking out the whole hip joint, as we see here on the right, uh, 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 much of the hip joint, uh, particularly the ball part of the hip joint is uh, is retained and a metal cap is put on the, uh, uh, on the top of the uh, ball part. So what it means is that there's less of your hip joint removed, uh, 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 and the potential advantages to this are that it kind of preserves more of your natural hip joint. So in theory, it should result potentially in better hip movements and better hip function, uh, and it's also less likely to dislocate. And this is due to the size of the cap that is put on the um, uh, on the uh, on the top of the uh, ball part. The big problem with with this uh, metal cap was that the bearing that was being used was uh, metal on metal, uh, and this led to big problems with metal ions. Uh, most hip replacements have a metal on plastic bearing or a ceramic on plastic bearing, which we see in a minute. But this uh, resurfacing uh, type of hip replacement has to use a metal on metal uh, bearing. And, and, and as a lot of people are probably aware, this caused uh, uh, major problems with early failure of a lot of uh, uh, patients who had hip uh, resurfacings. Uh, 
uh, and this was due to a problem called metallosis. Uh, here on the left, we see what a standard hip replacement bearing is like, where there's a metal uh, head and a plastic uh, 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 liner in the socket. With a resurfacing, there is a metal uh, uh, cap and a metal liner uh, in the socket. <clears throat> and, and this uh, resulted in uh, the production of uh, metal debris or wear uh, in the hip joint. And uh, this is demonstrated here in this black material. And it resulted in early failure of uh, hip replacements with up to 25% of hip replacements uh, failing at, uh, at the five year mark. When this is, you know, when this should be six percent, as a result, it was a a a, a big product uh, recall where uh, all these, you know, all these uh, uh, procedures were stopped, and all the all the previous uh, 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 um, uh, resurfacings had to be investigated, and some of them had to be had to be replaced. And because of that, hip resurfacing essentially uh, uh, died out and became a, a procedure that was no longer performed. Until 2019, uh, when uh, Andy Murray, the tennis player, famously had a, a had a Birmingham, which is a type of hip resurfacing procedure, uh, carried out. So it's, it has started to uh, reappear uh, in a very small uh, a, a subgroup or, or selection of patients. And uh, there is a, an argument that there may be a role again now for resurfacing in some patients. There may be better implants where this metal wear, wear is less likely to happen. And it may be better for younger patients uh, who are young and, and active and want to have uh, continue to have a very active uh, 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 sporting life in particular. So again, the, you know the rules are the same. We, we have to look at what does the evidence say as, as to uh, as, as to whether hyposurfacing is a is a good idea or not. In terms of how long they last, they last about ninety four percent for ten years, which is similar to a total hip replacement. Uh, and what about uh, how well they work? This is a, a paper published in the uh, in the BMJ, which is an, which is another uh, major medical journal, in 2018, and they looked at 60 patients who had hip resurfacing and 60 patients, 62 patients who had a standard total hip replacement, and they found no difference in function at any stage from six, six weeks uh, to five years. So where are we with hip resurfacing in 2020? Uh, is there a role for younger patients who are active, maybe patients who are uh, aged 30 to 50? Uh, is there improved um, implant technology where this metal wear effect is less? Uh, I would say for most patients, there is there's, there is no evidence to support this currently. Uh, and, you know, hip surfacing is, uh, is, is, generally, uh, is generally to be... Uh, uh, generally to be avoided due to the potential, you know, serious complications, as there's no evidence that, uh, at this current moment in time that it, that these patients do any better than uh, total hip replacement in terms of how long it lasts or uh, or how well it uh, or how well it works. So, question number five then is: Should I have a hip replacement if I am overweight, or what does or what does being overweight mean uh, 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 for me in terms of uh, of my hip replacement? This is a study, uh, again, another big study uh, 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 published in the uh, in 2020, and it looked at um, uh, how does being overweight uh, affect uh, having your uh, hip replacement. And they divided patients up into three different uh, uh, groups based on their body mass index, which is a measure which is a measure of how overweight or uh, how, or how obese you are based on your uh, weight and your height. Uh, and for patients with BMI less than 30, they were considered non-obese. Greater than 30, they were considered obese. And greater than 40, BMI greater than 40, they were considered morbidly obese. And these, this study is another great study because it looked at over 2 million patients and looked at their outcomes after having a, a total hip replacement. Uh, and they found that being over, overweight and having a hip replacement uh, resulted in a slightly increased risk of complications or problems after your hip replacement. Uh, and these figures here represent, uh, you know, uh, uh, how many times more likely you are to have a problem. So, for infection, which is which is which can be a big problem in hip replacement surgery or any joint replacement surgery, if you were uh, if you were obese to the point your BMI is over 30, you're 2.7 times more likely to have a problem with infection afterwards. 
If you were morbidly obese, where the BMI is greater than 40, that rises to 3.69 times more likely to have a problem with infection. In, in real terms, this changes from maybe from about 0.5% to 1.5 or 2% of patients uh, who have, uh, you know, who have uh, who have uh, hip replacement. But it, it is a significant number, and, and, it, and it is something that that uh, that patients uh, need to be uh, uh, aware of. There's also a slightly higher increased risk of dislocation, uh, uh, and uh, and uh, the need for uh, for ha having to have a second uh, hip replacement. So what does it mean? So being uh, being overweight and uh, being significantly overweight uh, does increase your risk of having uh, a complication after total hip replacement. Uh, I don't I don't think it means that you can't have a hip replacement, but it means that you, particularly for patients who are who are significantly overweight, you should consider a trial of weight loss or weight reduction uh, to to try and reduce and minimise uh, uh, the risk of having a problem after your hip replacement uh, uh, prior to having it. And it's important that patients uh, um, are aware of the risks, uh, and that uh, 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 and that uh, that you are given an opportunity and help to uh, you know to you know to lose weight and to drop uh, uh, your uh, BMI uh, before a surgery. So just to summarise, uh, uh, just to summarise the talk, uh, hip replacement involves replacing your hip joint with an implant to, uh, uh, to restore pain-free movement back into your hip. And, and, and with that comes uh, an improvement in your quality of life. In terms of how long hip replacements last, over half over half of patients can expect their hip replacement to last 25 years. Uh, in terms of how hip replacements are, are put in, there's uh, no evidence to support one approach over the other um, at this moment in time. Uh, for hip resurfacing, uh, there is uh, there is in there is no role or a minimal role for hip resurfacing. Uh, 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 at this current time, uh, being overweight uh, increases the risk of complications as slightly, and it's best to try and reduce uh, your weight uh, 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 prior to um, prior to, prior to surgery. So uh, I, I, I think the the uh, floor will now be open to anybody who has any questions, uh, and I would uh, I've discussed a lot of detailed. Uh, 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 papers there and everything I've uh, discussed and there's a lot of information I would direct you to my website which uh, which explains uh, 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 all the questions I've just discussed uh, uh, in uh, in relatively simple terms uh, 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 and, it's, and it's useful information for anybody who's you know who's thinking about having a, a hip replacement uh, thank you